2 Samuel chapter 11 is where we're at. Let me set the stage for you. By the way, um, God gave me this message to, to share not too long ago to all of the students at the Calvary Chapel Bible College, and, and I, I had endeavored and set out tonight to teach you guys uh, something completely different. I didn't want to teach something that I taught before, but I could not get away from this text and this message, and so uh, in, through what I believe to be obedience, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with you, and um, if you're among the few that were at the, the Bible college when I shared it, then God really wants you to hear this, so, <laughs> so there you go. This isn't me being lazy. This is just me putting, just being faithful to share what I think God wants me to, to share. So 2 Samuel chapter 11, and the, the, the way I'd set this up, uh, we all know the story of Apollo 13. Uh, and uh, some of you here, you were old enough to actually remember the story of Apollo 13 as I remember the story firsthand, uh, that uh, I watched the events unfold uh, in the excitement and the, uh, the fearful uh, anticipation, uh, even as, as, uh, as a young uh, boy watching these events. But, you know, Houston, we have a problem. Sudden explosion of a spacecraft headed to uh, the moon. And, uh, and here we have what has come to be known as uh, NASA's greatest failure, uh, where what started out as a train wreck explosion ended up becoming uh, one of their greatest rescue achievements in the, the, the engineering minds of those engineers at NASA to get those three astronauts home safely. But... What I want to focus on is that sudden explosion. And, and really, when you know the story of Apollo 13, what you come to find out is that though the explosion hit suddenly, it was actually a disaster waiting to happen. That that explosion actually started five years earlier. Their fate was sealed five years earlier. The tank, the oxygen tank, which would contain the... The, the, the oxygen for the astronauts to, to survive on as they went to and returned from the moon, well, it had within it a, a, a system of fans that were designed to stir the contents of the tank. And the tank was, in fact, dropped in production. And when it dropped, one of the interior uh, for, nozzles inside the, the tank was actually bent. And that, combined with a faulty design in that they laid the wiring inside the tank uh, for the flipping of the switch when the fans would go on, it causes the, causes the pressure within the tank to increase. Increased pressure produces heat. The heat hitting the exposed wires caused the insulation on the wires to melt away, caused a spark, and spark and oxygen does not go well together. And basically what they did was they created a bomb happened five years before. And I tell you that story by way of introduction to here in 2 Samuel 11 because this story, well, what David's going to do is he's going to explode. We're going to watch David explode tonight, and we're going to see that just like Apollo 13, that explosion was actually set in motion several years before. And as we get into this, I want you to prayerfully with your mind's eye I want you to focus on what the Lord would speak to you, not be distracted by the rain on the roof or by, by wondering, uh, gosh, I wonder what the Dodger score is or anything like that. Uh, I just want you to focus on what God might be speaking to you as it pertains to, man, is there something cooking in your life that is an explosion waiting to happen? 2 Samuel chapter, uh, or 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning in verse 1, it happened. In the spring of the year at the time... When kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon, and they besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. And then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed, and he walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold." 
And so David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, is that not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. So the story begins that it was the springtime of the year. It was that time of the year when kings go out to battle. In this day and age, wars were fought seasonally. As a matter of fact, you can watch Netflix specials looking at wars and battles that take place in Afghanistan, and those happen seasonally as well, where they wait for the right season to come out and to engage in battle. And so this particular spring, it's now open season on the people of Amman. Why is it open season on the people of Ammon? Well, prior to this, the father of a guy by the name of Hanun, who was the ruler of the Ammonites, had died. And David, in a heart of compassion, a legitimate desire to comfort this guy, he sent emissaries, ambassadors, to Hanun to comfort him at the, the death of his father. But Hanun, along with his advisors, they saw David's men coming, and rather than receive them as their their honest intent was just to offer condolences and, and, and encouragement and all, well, they got it in their minds that David's men were coming as spies, that they were coming to scope out all of, you know, the logistics there because they were getting ready to attack these, these, the, the, uh, the people, the Ammonites. And so... What happened was they took David's emissaries who came and and they basically beat them up and they shaved off half of their beards and they stripped them naked from the waist down, totally humiliated them and they sent them back. They, they, uh, you know, they're coming back and and seeing this. So basically David said, well, hey, you know what? I was going to comfort you. Now I'm going to kill you. Uh, and so his response then was, you know, okay, we're, we're going to battle over this. This is, this is not what friends do kind of thing. And the people of Ammon re- immediately recognized, well, we poked the bear. We, should, we, we, may, we might not, not have done that. We shouldn't have done that kind of thing. So what they did is they sent to the Syrians... And they said, hey, would you guys help us? The Syrians are bad dudes, you know, and they're like, hey, would you guys come? Would you help us fight against Israel? And so what happens then, Israel responded, split their forces, and they attacked, and they overwhelmed the enemy. Uh, The Ammonites, they retreated back to Ammon. The Syrians retreated, but then they regrouped. And, of course, a battle tactic, retreat, regroup, they're getting ready to attack again. And so what happened at this point, very strategic, and it is important for our story as we go, David then came and joined the battle at that point. He personally took charge of the, of the assault against the, the Syrians who were regrouping, and what happened is they fought against them and they routed them completely and utterly destroyed their forces. And then now the focus turned back to Hanun and the Ammonites. And so what happened is they attacked them and they besieged uh, Rabbah, the, the, the town, the city where they had retreated uh, to. Now, when you besiege a city, you basically surround them, you cut off their supplies, and you begin to wait them out. It is a battle of, uh, it is a, a long, arduous process where you're surrounding them, cutting them off, and waiting. But the text pointedly notes that David remained at Jerusalem. When, it, you know, when the, 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 the besieging took place, it was like, okay, now it's gotten into sort of the off season and we're going to put things on hold while the city is besieged, while the soldiers are, are there staying surrounded in, in this area. We sort of put the pause button on and now let's wait for the springtime and in the springtime we're going to resume what we're doing. And so the text notes that in the springtime, David remained in Jerusalem. And the, and the text tells us, but David remained in Jerusalem. In other words, the, the text is pointing out, the Bible is pointing out, the Holy Spirit making it clear 
that David isn't where he should have been. See, the basic duty of the king is to lead his forces into battle. But David here, he's taking his foot off the gas. He's starting to slack off. An important point that I'm going to put up on the screen is a matter of notes, and I'd encourage you to write it down. Tomorrow's sins of commission are often the result of today's sins of omission. The sins that you will commit tomorrow are often the results of the things that you omit in your life, the things that you're not doing in your life today. They set you up for that. And it would seem that God was warning David about this preemptively back in 2 Samuel chapter 10. You see, the Syrians were not defeated until David himself personally went and personally took command of the troops and led the troops. And now David has unfinished business with the Ammonites in Hanun. And what's happened is he's... Shucking his respos, got his foot off the gas. He's not engaged as he should have been. And I think, you know, that we need to take note here that victory requires your personal attention. This is what God seems to be telling David back in chapter 10. Look, victory requires your personal attention. Well, David didn't get the memo, and when he should have been at war, he's at home. First point of application, if you're taking notes, you can write it down. Defeat begins with inattention. Defeat in your life, in my life, in the life of David, it begins with inattention. Peter said in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Now check out that scripture right there, 1 Peter 5, 8. Your enemy walks about, walks about like a roaring lion. That phrase, walks about, in the original language, it's the word peripateo. And what it means, it means to walk with aim. It means to walk with purpose. It means to make due use of the opportunities that you have presented to you. And this is what the enemy does with us. For sure. The enemy walks with aim and purpose. The enemy prowls around like that roaring lion, walking with aim and purpose, looking to make a due use of an opportunity in your life or in my life. Years ago, we went to be part of a relief operation on the island of Samar in the Philippines. There had been a typhoon. And uh, we all got onto a ferry. We were bringing a bunch of, of supplies with us, chainsaws and all kinds of things. And the, the people in the airlines were great. I mean, we, we checked chainsaws in our luggage to go over. We checked all of the, 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 the oil uh, and stuff that goes with it in our checked baggage. And they just conveniently looked the other way as we checked all of that stuff because they knew what we were going to do. And we had a pile of this gear that we brought over, and we got on a, on a ferry going from one island to the other. And this ferry uh, went overnight. And even though you're all stuck on a boat, it was notorious that if you didn't watch your stuff, somebody on the ferry was going to steal your stuff. And so here we had this big pile of loot, and we just uh, worked out amongst us, all right, who's, who's keeping watch tonight? Somebody's got to stay awake, and we, we'll go it in shifts. And fortunately, we were able to book a room and put everything inside the room, and so it made our job a lot easier. But we had to keep an eye on the stuff because somebody would make due use of the opportunity to make merchandise of our stuff and to, to, to help themselves to our thing. And so, listen, we got to pay attention. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. we got to have our head on a swivel. Why? Because our enemy is looking to make due use of opportunities in our lives. The enemy is walking with aim and purpose even when you are not. And so we have to be careful about that. And we have to understand the enemy is a lot more pervasive than we realize. The the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6 that our battle is against principalities, it's against powers, it's against the rulers, the forces of of, of this world. Um, The Bible also tells us that our battle is against a, a satanic world system. In Romans chapter 12, it tells us not to be conformed to this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. 
As well, not only do we have Satan and his demons, not, demons, not only do we have the world system that, that, is, that is conspiring against us, our flesh is also conspiring against us. Galatians 5.17 says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. I want you to notice there is that satanic trinity that we have to watch out for. The, the Satan and his demons, the world system and the flesh, our sinful fallen flesh, all conspiring to make those due use of opportunities in our life, to walk with aim and purpose when in fact we are not walking with aim and purpose. And that's David's problem here. He's starting to walk in the flesh, he's not walking in the spirit. And so instead of leading the fight, he stays home. Now, why is it that he stays home? I have a speculation as to why. I think it has to do with that word besieged. That the battle, what they had done is they had besieged Ramah. And, you know, besieging a city, quite frankly, it's just a lot of hard, tedious work. It's not the exciting, the exciting thrill of battle. It's not the exciting thrill of hand-to-hand -hand combat. It is just a whole different kind of war. The tactic when you besiege an enemy is that you surround them, you cut off their supplies, you wait them out, and this means it's a long time. This means it's a very long effort. This means that you're living in tents out in the field for a very extended period of time, and that it is no picnic, and it's very likely that David said, do I want to be in the tent, or do I want to be in my bed at home? And I think that sounds a little bit better. I think I've sort of earned, you know, this position of kicking back and taking easy and so on. And so, listen, we have to, now it's a bit of conjecture, but regardless, we know that when he should have been at battle, he was lounging at home. And the application for us is this, that in our day-to-day -day battle against Satan and against sin and against this world system that wants to conform us, to press us into its mold. Listen, you and I need to understand that praying and reading our Bible every day, it's not always exciting. Sometimes it seems tedious, but it is, in, it, it is very important that, listen, I got I to gotta pray. I got to read my Bible. I got to get plugged into a community of believers. Now, I realize I'm preaching to the choir tonight. You guys have made an effort to do that, and I want to encourage you to continue to do that, not to grow weary in doing good, for in due season you'll reap if you don't lose heart. And so this is so important because, listen, the choices that we make today are going to dictate whether or not our life explodes tomorrow. Galatians 5.16 tells us, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Paul told the Romans in Romans chapter 5, he said, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and it's peace. And so that, that's that, that first thing for us is that defeat begins within attention. The second point, if you're taking notes, you can write it down. Defeat is a process. It's not an event. Defeat is a process. It's not an event. Now notice in our text what happens. It tells us that David walked on the roof. Again, what did he do? He walked without aim. He walked without purpose. Now I want you to compare that to our enemy. Right? First Peter 5.8 tells us that the devil walks about like a lion looking for his next meal. Walking with aim and walking with purpose, making due use of opportunities. It's a stark contrast what David is doing here. David is just meandering up on the, the roof. He walked on the roof, the, the original root word there, he meandered. He walked without aim and purpose. That's David's problem. I want you to imagine every wildlife video you've ever watched in your life. Who is it that the lion gets? He gets that gazelle that is ain't walking with aim and purpose. Is just sort of like, you know, clued out for a minute. And the next thing you know, he's lunch. You know, and that's the thing that we need to keep in mind. And so here's David. He's meandering away from the, her the herd. And it says that from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. He saw a woman bathing. I want you maybe to circle that, that phrase, he saw. 
And nearby, if you're given to taking notes in your Bible, you could write down ra'ah. That's the word. Here, let me tell you what it means. If you don't want to write ra'ah, you can write down this. You can write to inspect, to perceive, and to consider. David inspected, he perceived, and he considered the naked chick next door, Bathsheba. Now, this is ironic because he won't ra'ah his own walk he won't ra'ah to inspect, to perceive, and to consider so that he walks with aim and purpose. No, what he's going to do is to inspect and to perceive and to consider the naked chick who's next door taking a bath, right? And so what happens is he is completely got his eyes on the wrong thing. Now, that same word, ra'ah, we see it show up in, in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, specifically in verse 6, it tells us that Eve saw that she ra'ad the forbidden fruit. Now, when Eve first ra'ad, inspected, perceived, and considered the forbidden fruit, from God's perspective, she saw that it would bring forth death if she partook of the forbidden fruit. But that's not the perspective that in Genesis 3, 6, she inspects that fruit that she saw that fruit, that she ra'ad that fruit. No, in Genesis 3, 6, it tells us that she saw it from Satan's perspective. She inspected, she perceived, and she considered the fruit, not from God's perspective, but from Satan's perspective. Here's what it says. It says, the woman was convinced. She saw, she inspected, she perceived, she considered that the tree was beautiful. And its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom that it would give her, and so she took some of the fruit, and she ate it, and then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. Give me your attention really quickly. Some of you are in that place right now. Some of you, perhaps, are in the place where you have been walking without aim, and purpose. Maybe you're someplace you shouldn't be. Maybe you're seeing what the enemy wants you to see. Maybe it is that you're inspecting, you're considering, you're perceiving something from Satan's perspective, not from God's perspective. And it's a very precarious place for you to be in. And I want you to consider that, that maybe, hey, this is God's warning to you. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, if your right eye causes you, to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it's more profitable that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Now, this is what's known as hyperbole. Jesus is exaggerating something for the purpose of explaining the extreme measures that you should take not to be doing these things. He's not literally telling you to pluck out your eye. He's not literally telling you to cut off your hand. But he is saying, hey, you should employ extre extreme measures to, hey, not to have this cause you to be doing this thing. That phrase, cause you, it's the word scandalizo in the Greek. And a scandalon from which we get the word scandalizo, a scandalon is the trigger on a trap. My wife, we had rats at the house, and she'd, she'd had enough. She, one's too many. Uh, and so she asked me to set up a trap. And I was setting up rat traps, and I wasn't, I wasn't getting anything. And a buddy of mine told me, you have to put peanut butter on the trigger, on the scandalon. You got to put peanut butter on it. Because then, man, it sticks to it, and they got to work at it. And I'm telling you, man, it wasn't 10, 15 minutes later, all of a sudden I heard, I'm like, there it is, right there. Big old fatty rat. Didn't have the guts to do that again, you know. And, and so that, that, that trigger on that trap, that's the scandal on. Now, in the same way, listen, the enemy puts peanut butter on the trap for us. The writer of Proverbs said this, Proverbs chapter 7, talking about this this. this adulterous woman that's tempting. It says, So she seduced him with her pretty speech and enticed him with her flattery. He followed her at once like an ox going to the slaughter. He was like a stag caught in a trap, awaiting the arrow that would pierce its heart. He was like a bird flying into a snare, 
little knowing that it would cost him his life. So listen to me, my sons, and pay attention to my words. Don't let your heart stray away toward her. Don't wander down her wayward path, for she has been the ruin of many, many men have been her victims. Her house is the road to the grave. Her bedroom is the den of death. Now tonight, many of you are thinking, whew, that is not me. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, I've avoided that trap, and, and I'm not there, and I'm so grateful that I'm not there. And if that's, if that's the state you're in today, I say, praise Jesus, but listen, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We need to be careful and realize that, that, you know, not everybody who gets caught in the trap realizes that it's a trap, right? They just kind of get there, and all of a sudden, they're like, what on earth happened? It happened because you let your guard down. It happened because you began this long process, not at the moment of explosion, but years before by suddenly starting to compromise. We have to be careful about that. We need to understand for David, listen, this is simply, this isn't an event, right? This is something that started years before in his life. This is simply the culmination of something that had been going on in his life for 20 years. Because if you back up and you consider the life that David has lived up to this point, yes, he is a man after God's own heart, but he's also a guy who has an ongoing lack of restraint and indulgence of passion where women are concerned. We need to understand this ain't the first time. He's been disregarding God's plan for marriage for a long time. If you go back to 1 Samuel 25, what you'll see is that he took Abigail as his wife, and it tells us in the same chapter that then he took Ahinoam, whatever her name, Ahinoam as his wife, that chick, he, he took her too, right? And then 2 Samuel 3 tells us he took four more wives, six wives is plenty for anybody, good grief. Here's the point, sin is sequential. Sin is sequential. Sin happens, but it seldom just happens. And that's what we have to understand. It doesn't come out of nowhere. And we see this sequential process. James talks about this in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. He says, let no one say when he's tempted that I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, now look at this four-part four part process, this sequential part of process that he talks about. Each one is tempted when, number one, he's drawn away by his own desires. Number two, he's enticed. And then, number three, when sin has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And number four, and sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. There is a sequential process in this slippery slope. See, David's sin doesn't just suddenly appear. He set, this, he set himself up for this fall long before. Let me ask you a question tonight. Are you setting yourself up for a fall? Has there been a sequential process in your life? See, right now David's on the edge of a cliff. And that brings me to my third and final point tonight. Dave, a defeat comes down to a defining moment. Yes, it's a process. Yes, it's sequential. But it comes down, your defeat comes down to a defining moment. Look again at verse 3. It says, hey, David's already seen. He's already considered. He's already taken the second and the third look. He's already starting to formulate a plan. What happens? David sent and inquired about the woman. And look, notice... Someone said, somebody awesome, they're not even named, but someone's got the guts to try and put the brakes on where David's going. He says this, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? Listen, what we need to understand is that David here is being given a way of escape. The Bible says no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, but God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. See, David's going to nuke his life in the very next verse. But this is the way of escape that God is giving to him. 
tonight might be the way of escape that God's given to you. That you've come, that the Lord's knocking ever so gently on the heart of the door of your heart and saying, you got a sequential problem. You've got a slippery slope problem in your life. And I'm giving you a way of escape. See, the way of escape here is that this guy steps up and he's like, hey, listen, Bathsheba's father, this dude Eliam, Bathsheba's husband, this, this cat named Uriah, hey, David, these, these are your mighty men. They're listed among what the Bible calls David's 30 mighty men. These are the guys that have been David's closest companions. And the Lord here just whispering to David going, you don't want to be that guy. These guys have been so faithful to you. And that's his daughter. That's his wife. And I'm telling you, you need to realize what it is that you're about to do. These are your closest comrades, David. Do you want to be that guy? Not only that, Eliam was the son of Ahithophel, who was David's personal counselor. These aren't just random guys. These are like faithful friends and counselors and confidants and guys who put their life on the line for you, David. And we're going to see that Uriah the Hittite, as the story unfolds, and you guys know that as you've read through it, Uriah the Hittite proves to have more honor than David. He comes back. David wants to cover up his sin once he commits it. And so he's like, hey, bring that guy back from the battle line. And he pretends to want to get a report from him about how the battle's going. And then he's like, all right, go home to your wife. Because he wants him to sleep with her so that like when the, she, she finishes up pregnant. And, and so he's like, well, I don't, you know, if he sleeps with her, then it's his kid, right? And so he tries to do that. And, and Uriah says, well, I'm not going to do that. All the guys are out on the battle line, uh, battlefield. They're fighting. Like, am I going to be that guy? Am I going to go home and enjoy my wife and my house when all the guys are out on the battlefield? And you know that had to sting David because David was like, no, because that's what I did, right? And so, no, I'm not going to do that. And so then what's he do? He goes to plan B, gets them all liquored up. Let me get this guy drunk, see if he can go do that. And, and he, won't, he, he just won't compromise. And we know the story. David goes and kills him. And so we read there in verse 4, even with all the warnings, David sent messengers and he took her and she came to him and he lay with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity. The Bible's making it clear that we know she wasn't pregnant by Uriah the Hittite. She'd had her period. She was now cleansed from her impurity. She clearly doesn't have a child. She sleeps with David. She returns to her house. And of course, she's going to become pregnant. I want to wrap this up with this. I want to just lay this out there. And I just want to say, look, if you're here today and God's warning you with this, if, if you're here and God's been speaking to you and just saying, look, you've got a sequential problem, you've got a, you've got a slippery slope problem in your life, listen, I want you to recognize tonight as a way of escape and respond to what you've heard and, and be able to come to the Lord tonight and say, Lord, you know my heart, you know my sin you know my situation, my circumstance. And Lord, I need to come to you and I need to confess my sins. The Bible says if we confess our sins, that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word confess, it means to agree with God. That you agree with God that your sin is in fact sin. You don't make an excuse for it. You agree with God that in Jesus Christ, he has forgiven you and cleansed you of that sin and cast it as far as the east is from the west. That there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Just as Pastor Josh was sharing tonight. That, hey, man, I need to get into this place and I need to take this way of escape. And maybe you're here tonight and you didn't take that way of escape. But listen, God would say to you tonight, you have the opportunity to repent, to receive me. Listen, here's what John says, 1 John 1. If we're living in the light... As God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But if we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and we're not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim we have not sinned, we're calling God a liar and we're showing that his word has no place in our hearts. I want to tell you that the grace of God is beautiful, it's awesome, 
It's available to every single one of us tonight. 